I mean, they're not aggressive. They're not going to bite you or anything. They're just used to people. So any sort of lizard type thing. All right. All right, we're recording. Shut up. This semester, not today, though. You should only take one time in a day. Hey. See, I just finished saying it should only take one time, and I was babbling again. A group of moose. No, it's not meese. I'm going to say it's moose. No, like, you know how it's like a flight of birds? No, I understand. It's like a flock of birds. That's yeah. what you're really saying. Well, you're saying, what's the equivalent for moose? I'm going to say it's still moose. Okay, no, it's herd. It's herd? A herd of moose? Yeah, yeah I get it. It's a murder of crows, right? Yeah. All right, so let's keep let's keep trucking here. All right, where did we oh, start here? Mac OS X Intel. Okay, so kind of just catching us up a little bit from uh, uh, I did push record. Let me just double check. Keys. Okay, we're good, and we're sharing screen. We're good. Um, we will have a student joining us from uh, Concordia, Irvine, California. Um, uh, hopefully next week, I'll have to play catch up, but uh, they're completing their degree program there using this class. So that's um, going to be a interesting thing. So you can talk about the cost of living in California or a golf course right next door. So they try. They tried to get me to come start a computer science program there, uh, like a, maybe 12, 12 years ago. My wife didn't want to move. Uh, that's not a golf course. No, there's nothing wrong with missing links, but that's a driving range. And they, they have a little par three thingy. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, she didn't want to move to California. I know. My dad knows the professor that Irvine is the professor at Harvard, and um, like they, they live in like apartments and stuff, so, like what we could get to like houses. Sure. Like, which, yeah. And it's just kind of like. All right, let's keep let's keep trucking. Let's keep trucking. But yeah, cost of living there is crazy. Um. What? So, what? I was going to ask for the thing in my middle. Like with the windmills and stuff. Yeah. Like that, that kind of mini golf. I mean, it's fine, but it's not golf. Um, okay, so uh, kind of as a reminder, we probably have a slide about compilers in here, right? There. So dealing with compilers when you have code and it's compiling, it has to target two different things: the architecture. So what's the assembly language for the processor you're compiling for? And then what's the operating system? Because the output of a compiler is going to be a low-level language that is the assembly code compatible with that particular CPU for that for the, what you're compiling for. But it's also going to take into account the magic tricks provided by the operating system. That's the systems programming crap we're going to be looking at in here. Those magic tricks. We're not going to be looking at it from the angle of low level programming. We're going to be looking at the it from the angle of, hey, what if I'm writing C code that's doing normal crap, but I want to leverage the operating system to do some stuff. Okay. Uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll kind of talk about, we'll probably get to it today. Maybe we'll see um, what some of those things might end up uh, looking like. All right. But real important concept here for us is that idea when you take software and you compile it, um, which is kind of why a lot of these new programming languages that come out are all interpreted. Way easier to make an interpreted language than a compiled language. Because compiled languages require this all this crap and they have to write that tool that's gonna convert that programming language to whatever architecture and whatever operating system you want the output of that language to support, right? Kind of the purpose, one of the reasons why Java, we can say, had a reasonably good idea where they said, look, we're going to target one architecture and one operating system. The architecture was Java Virtual Machine, the Java bytecode, the assembly code for Java, 
the Java virtual machine. And the operating system was the Java virtual machine. And then what they did is they wrote the Java virtual machine multiple times for the different operating systems, right? So the compiler for Java presumably is a easier compiler to write because they're only targeting a single architecture and a single operating system with the assumption that that Java virtual machine was written multiple times, probably in a language like C that already had compilers for it, right? So they sort of kind of cheated. So we can almost look like Java, look at Java and say, um, they're almost the compiled version of an interpreted language. Kind of an interesting uh, connection. Uh, and I think it's part of why Java has been uh, so successful is you get a lot of the advantages of an a, a, of a compiled language while having fairly optimized code because you only had to write the compiler for targeting a single architecture and a single operating system and it's based on an underlying language of i assume c probably it might be c plus plus but i assume c so c we're going to say super fast we're going to say a compiler very optimized because it only had to target you know one architecture, one operating system that seems like it'd be an easier problem to solve than writing a compiler that targets a zillion things, right? Um, but on top of that, Java loses some speed because of the, you know, kind of the, the interpreted nature of it where your code runs in the virtual machine, which then translates it to the magic tricks for the underlying architecture. So you get fast with C, you get fast with optimized low level uh, bytecode, and then you get slow with that last second interpretation where you're going from one low level language to another low level language. Java bytecode to Intel assembly, let's say, something like that. Um, so in the end, Java is a pretty fast language, relatively speaking, right? Not video game fast, at least from a graphics perspective, but plenty fast for all business applications and that kind of junk, all right? But we really want to think about this idea of what the job that a compiler is doing, because that's really important. And if you go back prior to very early operating systems that didn't have, we're going to be talking about like APIs, um, didn't have a list of system calls, a list of magic tricks, software based magic tricks that the operating system knew how to pull off. That means your assembly code had to do all of it. We looked at the hello world program in Linux assembly last class and you know it looked kind of cryptic like oh I'd much prefer saying system.out.println hello world or just print hello world and like Python. You know i'd still rather do that, but it didn't look that ridiculous right it's like you know, what, 12 lines of code something like that doing a couple of weird things you're like ah oh, yeah, it's kind of weird, but I kind of get it load some crap into some registers tell the operating system to go look and do do your thing. Um, but keep in mind that that's still just a Habsy approach. That's still using the magic tricks. That's leveraging that operating system. If you didn't have a target operating system and all you were doing is targeting an architecture, the Intel architecture, and you wanted hello world to spit out to the screen, the output of that assembly code is going to be huge because now you're talking directly to the hardware. You'll have assembly code that's working with how the frame buffer works with the graphics card where it's coming back and it's talking to things on the CPU directly, not going by way of operating system that already solved that hard problem for you. It'd be a crazy looking program that you would not have wanted to write by hand. Kind of makes some sense. So operating systems give us a lot of uh, powerful tools. Um, we can almost think of them as like software based CPUs where the magic tricks probably accomplish quite a bit. You know, like syswrite does just believe me when I say a whole bunch of crap has to happen in order for something to get written out to the screen. It's not as easy as it sounds like it should be. And we can kind of feel that. We've seen that before. To show, remind you with it here. Well, I'll just write it in there real quick. No, this is good enough. What language am I in? I'm in Java. Okay. 
you know, so you've probably seen me do something like this before. So if I want to do a counter and I say for int i is equal to zero, i is less than what is that? a million, a billion, something like that. That's a hundred thousand, that's a million, that's ten million. Millions probably enough, but let's just go with that. Uh, actually, we'll stop stop in a million. And we're going to say count plus plus, and then we'll say system dot out dot print Yeah. So I'm doing a single display to the screen, but I'm adding stuff a whole bunch of times, a million times. That program ran pretty quick, right? It felt like there was a little delay, but the question was, well, was the delay because this is web-based or was the delay something else? Who knows? But it wasn't a major thing, right? If I just move this line inside there where I'm printing every single time, this program is going to run for a bit. You know, kind of ridiculous. Right, it's going to take a little bit to run, and the reason for that is doing I/O on a computer is expensive. Not only do you have to, uh, does the, the processor have to take a break, and we'll talk about this more later. But um, something you should have learned in the um, uh, when a uh, tell me if you know this. Here's an operating system quiz question: What is it called when a process has not run out of CPU time, but needs to leave the CPU for another reason? Or even if it's run out of CPU time, when a process leaves the CPU, what's that process called? Uh, an interrupt might be the guy who causes it to leave it early. So if, if it didn't naturally run out of time on the CPU, it's because it maybe was interrupted. Um, but what's that actual process of a process leaving the CPU and having to get back in line for its next turn for CPU time? Hopefully it was kind of advertised as this is one of the big enemies for speed with uh, uh, operating systems. It's called a context switch. So you have this idea of context switching and the idea of a context switch is when you have a CPU, you have all these hardware registers, right? basically hardware type variables. And when a process gets onto the CPU, you know, he has like a suitcase with him. And you know, let's assume it wasn't his first time on the CPU. He's he got back in line, he's coming back on the CPU. So he has to unpack his bags, you know, refill all the processor uh, process, uh, the uh, registers with the data that you know he left last time so he could pick up where he left off, right? Sets the program counter to the right thing, loads AX, BX, all the different uh, hardware registers with the right uh, uh, data to, to start with. Uh, and then he goes back to town until he either gets interrupted or he runs out of his next allotted amount of CPU time. So then the, then the operating system, hey, you're out of time, get off the CPU. So as he's getting off the CPU, he has to repack that suitcase, he has to grab the values of all the different hardware registers, put them back in the suitcase so that next time he gets the CPU again, he has his starting point. He can pick up where he left off, right? Now, if we just look at that, there's some more stuff going on than just that, but we just stop there. We can kind of see that it's actually pretty complex leaving the CPU and getting onto the CPU, right? Now, what I'm telling you is that doing any IO so in this case, if we just think about the assembly language this guy might produce, let's just assume it's not a whole lot of assembly language. We have, we're gonna have a lot of jumps where we say, do this, so add one, then display something. Ah, display something. That's not something the CPU does, that's something that the operating system is gonna do for me with another process that's gonna get onto the CPU. So that's gonna be a forced context switch before he actually runs out of time. He maybe did, three lines of code or something like that. Um, and then he said, oh, I finished what I can finish here. I just spent all my time unpacking my bags only to do three lines of code out of my 100,000 that I would have accomplished before. I'm just making up a number, but a lot more than three, right? 
Um, and now I got to pack my get bags again and get off the CPU because no IO is what I need to do now. And that's not my job. That's another process's job. So he's gone. That's why there's these delays. That's why it takes so long because this guy's not doing it himself. That makes sense. Um, so context switching would be something that's considered to be expensive on the CPU, but a necessity when it, this is like an example of when you're forcing very often context switching. And it comes with the, it being very slow. Where math, super, super fast. Processes are pretty good at doing math, especially adding, built right in there, good to go. <laughs> you got a you got a single CPU magic trick for adding. It's great, and adding one even easier. There's even a special trick just for adding one. So it was super fast. I had to be website slow down. All right. So. We had talked last time when Steve Jobs came back to Apple. One of the things he did is he, you know, identified that Mac OS 9 was a crappy operating system, which it was. You know, I, I don't care what the Apple fanatics who were already drinking the Kool-Aid were saying back then. Okay, DOS, Windows, well, at that point, OS 9 was out. We we're probably talking its direct competitor was probably 98 possibly XP, but let's just say it was Windows 98. Um, and, um, you know, who had the better operating system? Microsoft did. You're not gonna find any Apple person who's gonna admit to that, but 100% that was the better operating system. Even if we talk, so one of the things we will talk about that hopefully you talked about uh, um, uh, some in the uh, 350 class is multitasking. How is multitasking actually accomplished, right? So you kind of have two different forms of multitasking. You have pre preemptive multitasking. And what preemptive multitasking does is it uh, um, kind of puts a process on like hospice. You know, it's just got enough uh, CPU time to stay alive on the system, but it's not accomplishing much. So if you were like a Mac OS 9 user or, or earlier, any Mac OS uh, that were supported multitasking, you might have a situation where you went to a web page, you started downloading something, it's gonna take some time because back then you might have, you were probably still on the dial-up modem, right? Um, or early days of the internet with DSL or cable modem. So slow relative compared to today, slow internet speeds. So you get something that's gonna maybe take three hours to download, just making something up. And then you switch over to Microsoft Word or, or whatever, or Apple Write to, to work on your um, uh, uh, term paper or something like that. So you go and work for three hours while your program, whatever you were downloading is working in the background. Now, if you're doing that on a modern day operating system, if it said it was gonna take three hours, you come back three hours later, it's probably gonna be about done, right? On Mac OS 9, it wouldn't have been. You would have come back and that download the, the you know whatever browser you're using netscape or safari uh you know whatever browser you were you were using on the mac at the time this is before safari actually um you uh um it was getting such low cpu time that it wasn't downloading at its full rate you probably made very little progress on your download during those three hours because all the cpu time 99.9% .9 of the CPU time was going to the application that you had um, in the forefront, okay? Our modern multitasking model gives time slices to uh, the, the, you probably talked about some of the different multitasking algorithms in 350, but it gives, at some level, it gives time slices. Like you get a little time on the CPU, you get a little time on the CPU, so on and so forth with the idea that CPUs are really, 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 really fast. Even when we had single core CPUs, okay, with single core CPUs, they were still super fast, right? Because all we have to do, the whole job of a computer, along with an operating system, is to fake the user out. As long as the user is happy, it doesn't matter what's actually happening behind the hood, right? Or under the hood. So if you had a single core CPU where it could literally only do one thing at a time, you know, the idea is those processors could do things really, really, really fast. 
So if you had three different programs, let's say the three of you were each a process, we had three different programs running on the CPU at once, what would happen? Well, he would get a little CPU time, she would get a little CPU time, you would get a little CPU time over and over and over and over again. And the three of you would all feel like you're getting 100% of the CPU time because it was all happening so quickly, right? And even with those context switches, you weren't noticing it because you weren't visually measuring it like we just did. You know, we saw the context switching going down where so it was like, oh, that seems like something I wouldn't have liked when the program was running. But it's something that probably has happened before. And as long as a program still feels responsive, you can click on crap and things open and stuff like that, you're fairly happy, right? So computers and operating systems relied on how fast a, uh, a computer could do instructions and would just fake out the end user perfectly happy with it. So a modern multitasking model will take advantage of that and your download would have made major, major, major progress. So perhaps it would have only been, I'm just gonna make a 95% efficient compared to it just running in the foreground the entire time in a single uh, process operating system before multitasking. Maybe it would have downloaded slightly quicker because it wasn't constantly handing off from the CPUs, but it would have been pretty good. It would have been fine is the kind of the, the punchline. Where Mac OS 9 and 8 and 7 using this preemptive model, it was garbage. You made no progress in the background. It was a bad operating system. All right, so Steve Jobs comes back. What does he do? He introduces Mac OS X. And uh, which was based on Next Computer's operating system, um, uh, which is that company that Steve Jobs went and founded when he left, when he was fired from Apple, yada, yada, yada. Apple then acquired Next Computers, comes with Steve Jobs. They install him as the interim CP, CEO, the ICEO, whatever. He starts doing some good crap, saves Apple. Um, but uh, he releases uh, Mac OS X. Um, now, what's interesting here, and I've maybe shown this in another class before, but if I do um, um, objective C string, here's the developer documentation for um, uh, the coding library, the, the the um, you can think of this as the API for what was called Coco, which is Apple's API in the early days of Mac OS X. And a string is called an NS string, next step string. So to this day, Apple Apple died a long time ago. So what we have today is next computers with an Apple logo on it, with Steve Jobs ideas driving the, the hardware model moving forward. Okay relatively unimportant just kind of an interesting thing under the hood because that's not a consumer facing thing right from a cons consumer perspective but they watch the movies they might think oh well apple almost died and then steve jobs brought him back from you know from from death or something like that but it really just became a new company that just took all of apple's um you know marketing <laughs> I, I guess and and just kept uh, kept going well but it didn't end up being bought out Apple acquired Next Computers and then just decided, oh, that's going to be a, us now. <laughs> We're going to be that guy. Um, so I, I, I guess you can think they got bought out. Yeah, but they didn't run two companies. They just became one. But whatever. All right. So in any case, Steve Jobs releases Mac OS X, which causes a, a, the first problem, right? Because now all of your applications that used to run on Mac OS 9 that were compiled for that time it was the power PC processor made by IBM. That was your architecture. So you had to run power PC based risk uh, RISC, reduced instruction set code. Uh, reduce, is that the C code? Uh, whatever, risk processors. Um, so it had its own assembly language, which was different than Intel based assembly. So those programs that were running on Mac OS 9 were targeting the power PC architecture as well as the OS9 uh, operating system, okay? Now, realistically, when you think about as operating systems come out, they try to be backwards compatible with the previous operating system. So, 
you know, when uh, Windows uh, 11 uh, just came out, the expectation was the programs that were running in Windows 10 would still run, right? And for the most part, they did. So some applications, you know, came out with updates that maybe took advantage of some of the new bells and whistles of Windows 11. But generally speaking, if you had Microsoft Office installed on, and maybe that's a bad example because they're both made by Microsoft, but if you had a program that was running on Windows 10, it probably still ran on Windows 11. Fair enough? Okay, because they made their operating systems backwards compatible. Which means that at the very least, the system calls that were built into the compiled code of your stuff that was compiled for a previous version of Windows, those system calls were still present in the new version of Windows, even if they maybe added some new system calls that maybe make things better or something like that. Okay, well, when we went from Mac OS 9 to Mac OS X, that was not just an improvement to OS 9. That was a brand new operating system. That was a Unix based operating system that had a very different list of system calls. Many of those system calls may have done the same stuff as the previous guy. They probably had their equivalent of syswrite in Mac OS 9, but it wasn't called syswrite. So all those programs that worked yesterday on Mac OS 9 no longer work on Mac OS X because even though they were compiled for the same architecture, PowerPC, they were compiled for the wrong operating system. So I think I mentioned last class that um, uh, Mac OS X, the original version came with a virtual machine, okay? Um, kind of like VirtualBox or kind of like uh, what VMware Fusion or uh, uh, VMware uh, brings, uh, uh, not VMware, Parallels brings to the, uh, the table with Mac OS 9 pre-installed. So you basically could run Mac OS 9 as a, in a virtual machine on Mac OS X so that you could run your programs that worked yesterday at like half the speed because it was being virtualized using the same, but it's, they, they technically worked. So deal, all right. Um, now from a consumer, we can say, oh, well, this sucks. That's just them doing a money grab or whatever. But at the same time, we can say, you know what? This, this is actually something that had to happen in order to get things moving forward. You had, you can't just, you, it might not always make sense to upgrade the last iteration of a piece of software. You might need to go to a, a fresh start and do something, do something different. And that comes with these growing pains. All right. Apple's survived the growing pains, you know, over the next year or so, most of the software companies did rewrite uh, port is usually called port their software over to um, the OS X operating system um, using the PowerPC architecture. Okay, so Apple then started becoming pretty pretty popular, started coming out with the cats, right? You know, the Mac OS X, uh, you know, what was there? Mac OS X. I don't think it was Cheetah, was it? Oh, well then you're probably right. Yeah, you're right. So Cheetah, then, you know, Puma, just cats, right? You know, um, and I don't remember which was the first uh, first Mac OS or Intel Tiger January of '06. Kind of interesting. So when I first started here at Concordia. They had just converted over to Intel. So you had two different kinds of computers running. Uh, people who bought their computers prior to January of uh, 2006 from Apple were running PowerPC. And then people who bought it after that were running Intel. So you, you would have had two groups of people running Mac OS X uh, 4, 10.4, Tiger, some of which are on the PowerPC architecture, some of which are on the Tiger ar architecture. So that was another let's call it probably a year of transition aches and pains that they had already barely survived, uh, what, six years before that, when they first came out with Mac OS X. So they survived it six years prior, and now they're just gonna do it again. Six years prior, they switched the, uh, the OS uh, 
architecture, whether you be OS system calls, now they're switching the actual underlying architecture to Intel. Um, but the point is, is that the Intel processors gave them a much, uh, much more future proof because PowerPC was really having, and IBM was having problems making quality PowerPC. All right, so this was Mac OS X 10.4. Okay, um, and then you know, I'm guessing it's going to be 2000, uh, 2019, maybe. Big sir, okay. So we had leopard, snow leopard, lion, mountain lion, mavericks, Yosemite. Oh, so this was the this was the transition here after mountain lion. So I, uh, that was actually one of Apple's what I felt was their more more entertaining keynotes uh, in recent years. Um, you know they were tr trying to announce their next operating system, and uh, you know like you know, we're starting to run out of cats, and they. Um, um, And this is on their slide. Yeah. <laughs> so, that was, so during their keynote, they said, well, maybe Mac OS X Sea Lion? I wish they had gone with it. <laughs> so, uh, and actually, I thought there was another picture where was, they might have had a couple of slides. There was one where it was bouncing a, a beach ball. <laughs> maybe that was a spoof um, that I'm recalling. Um, but, uh, um, you know, but that's when they made their transition to, hey, we're going to start naming it after like things that are recognizable in nature, you know, that kind of that kind of stuff. Um, but in any case, we can see all of these updates. So these are all incremental updates to Mac OS X, right? So they're still based on the Intel architecture uh, up to uh, a point. When did you say Big Sur? Yeah, that's good enough for our conversation here. So uh, that was in 2020. Yeah, so you know, right around that that time. So up until late 2019, 2020, whatever, it's when Apple announced the M1 processor. Okay, so so Mac OS X. What was that one? Ten point. Oh, it's just Mac OS X 11. Okay, but it also supported Intel. So right now you can still, uh, all their operating systems are, they support both. Um, so Apple introduces M1 architecture. Okay, so Apple starts making their own processors. They changed it again, right? So we went from PowerPC to Intel, chilled for a while, 13, 14 years, right? Then we went to back to Apple Silicon. You know, it's not, it sounds like, you know, better in a keynote when they say, now we're using our own silicon. Rather than to say we make our own, well, really, we bought our own processor company. <laughs> it's now making processors for us. Um, from a computer architecture perspective, and we talk about this in the uh, 548 uh, uh, grad class, um, and uh, if I teach 325, I talk about it some in there. Um, uh, M1 is really a good chip. So uh, uh, now they have the M1 Pro, M1 Max. Um, I think Intel's got some catching up to do. Uh, when it comes to some of the stuff that they're they're doing, the uh, the example I've used is um, I have uh, you know this computer which has a you know bazillion gig gigabytes of memory and stuff like that. So this is 64 gigs of RAM, 
<clears throat> it has uh, 16 logical core i9 processors. So Intel, super high end, yada, yada, yada. Uh, if I have a full battery on this machine and I go on a Zoom meeting for an hour, at the end of that meeting, I'm at about 70, 75% battery life, something like that. I have a MacBook Air that's running the M1 processor. Now, if I'm doing video conversion or something like that, well, this guy's gonna be a little bit beefier, a little bit faster for doing those things, but the M1 feels just as fast for 99% of the stuff I do with a computer. If I do that same Zoom meeting for an hour on an M1, what do you think my battery is at the end? Close. 99. And sometimes I still see 100. <laughs> It's ridiculously power uh, conservative. Uh, it's it to the point where it almost feels impossible. So it's a uh, pretty impressive stuff because usually when we use our computers, we're not doing high end stuff, right? Now I promise, if you try to run a video game on the M1 processor, um, you know, which has a pretty good built in GPU, and now the new ones have very good built in GPUs. This is really where they've become kind of their special sauce where they have memory that's shared between the CPU and the GPU. So and the bandwidth between those two is crazy fast. Um, and Apple's kind of claiming that their um, uh, M1 Max processor has similar GPU performance to a uh, uh, NVIDIA 3080 GPU. I've looked at the benchmarks. I feel like that might be a slight stretch. But certainly 3070, I think comfortably a 3070 CPU, which I mean, that's doing high end VR. So that's on the processor graphics card, because if you see a 3070, how many of you have ever seen a, you know, a, a high end gaming GPU? <laughs> so it's this thing like this, right? So it's, it's you know, it's like, like that thick. Okay, it's like this long, it won't fit in some cases. Right, it's requiring two different power supplies coming into the thing for you know to keep the fan. It's got like three fans on it. Some of them have fans on both sides. Some of them have plugins for liquid cooling. Okay, these are not things that typically live on a processor. Okay, so the fact that so if we even take the NVIDIA thirty seventy GPU, this will give us a picture of it. I'm sure. There we go. That's what that guy looks like. Yeah, it's on sale. Now, what's funny is the 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 retail. Oh, this is actually a 3090, but still, the retail price for this was supposed to be, I think, maybe like 12, 1200 bucks, whatever, for the 3090. Um, but all the Crypto miners. I'm surprised. That, are, are them. I'm honestly surprised that for thousand right now because like it used to be at like four or five thousand. Yeah, crypto's on a downward swing this week. Um, so here you can see the. Well, how thick the the thing is, but punchline is these things are big fat graphics cards and even this is this is apple's largest laptop that i have sitting in front of me right here this is a, Ma a macbook pro 16 inch apple doesn't make a bigger laptop than this and, and here the the thickness of this machine is the 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 thickness of my thumb there ish okay that graphics card ain't fitting in there right and the 3070 looks pretty similar to to this guy here's it here this is the 3060 this is underpowered i mean i guess you don't have you don't need the cooling with their M1. Yeah, it's it's ridiculous uh, what their new architecture is uh, uh, is doing. So that's kind of something that Apple's doing pretty cool right now. But in any case, what we have from our perspective is in uh, what do we say? This was 2006, and this was 2020 ish. Apple has now thrown another cog into the wheel and said, "Hey." We're going to uh, um, switch back away from Intel to our own silicon because we think it's better. And from an architecture perspective, I believe it's also better for most of our tasks. Like I said, if you're doing high end pro type type stuff, um, there is going to be examples where Intel will outperform it. Um, 
I doubt you will find very many examples where Intel will outperform it from a power consumption perspective. Um, probably you won't find any examples of, of that. But sometimes power consumption isn't a, an issue, right? It's only an issue if you're running around with a battery. Okay. Most, I mean, I have this plugged in right now, so I'm going to finish class at 100%. No problem, no harm, no foul, and I'm not paying the power bill. Oh, I'm just burn fossil fuels, great. Well, there might be some windmills around here or something like that. You know. Go green. I have no idea. Yeah. Well, it's gonna be well, it might be covered in snow depending on when they took the pictures. But but regardless. Yeah, what, see, we're going green. And I drive a Tesla, so I'm well, I'm not green yet, though. Apparently, I think you have to have a Tesla for three years before you yeah, you break even. Oh yeah, it only it was only out of commission for like two months, uh, but um, but it cost it costs like fifty grand to fix. How does this, how does this like self driving even work? Pretty good as long as the cameras can see the lines. If they can't see the lines, then it's guessing, and you end up who knows where. <laughs> On the side roads probably yeah but i don't use the self-driving on like in town like it's academically interesting when i get a new software update i'll have it like self-drive me from my house to n7 downtown Grafton or something like that let's see if it does better with left and right turns and that kind of stuff um it's almost always it'll get you there but sometimes it does some questionable things um just to see how it's updated but i mostly use uh, autopilot for interstate driving it's like perfect for that. Um, and then I even do it like a video game. I don't, I used to let it change lanes on its own, but sometimes it gets kind of crazy with that, where if, the, if the things slow down, it'll just start changing lanes and then, you know, switch back and forth and, and, and things like that. And uh, there's times like, I mean, I'm a fairly, I'm not an aggressive driver from a, a speeding perspective, but I feel like I'm a relatively skilled driver. Uh, there's been times where it changed lanes when math said it was okay, where I would have never changed lanes. I would have never changed lanes. And it's like, you know, they had like an inch of clearance on both sides. And it's like, whoa. You know, it had been monitoring the speed of that car coming up. So it was like, sure, it wasn't going to close that inch gap. And then, like, everyone else is looking at you like you're a bad guy. Well, and one of the settings on it on the the Tesla for like how how you want it to handle lane changes stuff. One of so it's like a, a comfort that it's normal, and then there's Mad Max. <laughs> yeah, I'm not kidding. There's a setting called Mad Max. Yeah, so it's a. I mean, it's neat. But apparently it's like 20 years, like something like 20% less green to build a Tesla than it is to build a gas powered vehicle. So it takes like three years before like you break even, even using, you know, charging the batteries with your fossil fuel that's <laughs> coming out of your outlet, I guess. Um, but uh, I never keep cars that long. So, I mean, this Tesla will be gone as soon as my Cybertruck comes out. Um, and then I'll keep that for like two years and then I'll get whatever the newest one is. I want to get a pink cyber truck. They haven't announced the colors yet. I'm not kidding. I mean, you, haven't you noticed I wear a lot of pink shirts? There's people at my country club that say they don't recognize me if they, if I wasn't, if I'm wearing like more of a plain, like less flashy colored shirt. I don't like it. My wife bought me this like dark maroon shirt for my birthday because she likes that color on me. So I have to like choose to wear it sometimes like to church or whatever to make her happy. What were we talking about? Oh, Tesla's. So, <laughs> no, so we're talking about Apple going back to their M1. Kind of an interesting thing here though that they did. No, I wasn't kidding. Yeah, there is a Mad Max setting. It's legitimately a setting in there called Mad Max. Maybe this will have it on the picture.
um, see it built onto the process. They have a bunch of other like machine learning crap, stuff like that. But the thing I'm specifically looking for is they have a, like I mentioned, when they first came out with the uh, uh, Mac OS X from OS 9 to OS X, they had that blue box. They have a virtual machine for letting you run your applications. Well, the second the M1 processor comes out, the, the software you ran yesterday is no longer going to work. New architecture, right? Same reason. Okay. But it did um, uh, run it. Ah, here it is. It's called Apple Rosetta. So Rosetta in real time translates executables. So it's running your Intel code and doing a translation in real time to M1 native architecture without running it through a virtual machine. And most of the uh, uh, benchmarks show that it's, you're not losing a whole lot of performance. Um, so it, it does a good job at the very least. So I would say if you look at this from a uh, hiccup in the road perspective, it was a very different situation when they jumped from Intel to uh, M1. And, and, and right now, Apple still sells Intel machines. So we're in the middle right now, uh, even among their MacBook Pros. So um, actually, no, I'm lying. You can't buy a MacBook Pro anymore new from Apple that's running Intel because now they announced the M1 Pros and M1 Maxes. You can't get them like two, two months back ordered or whatever. Um, but uh, there's no graphics card. Yeah. Well, you know, you have a graphics card tomorrow as long as you're willing to pay three grand for it. No problem. Uh, more than a long time. We pre ordered from NVIDIA uh, our education. You know, we pre ordered uh, the 3000 series. We did 23080 TIs and 2390s from NVIDIA when they first announced the GPUs. This is a couple of years ago. We pre-ordered from the company that makes them. Still have not received the cards. Not from like a, a vendor, the, the company. Because they're selling it to the highest bidder. We, oh yeah, they say, oh, we're just a supply problem. We've already overpromised, you know, they can't make the chips fast enough. We've already overpromised to other vendors that are paying higher price than us. They should give you a refund. Oh, well, they didn't charge our card yet. Yeah, we, we're not out the money. We just, you know, felt like we were in line. You got to have some, some level of first come, first serve. So now the best way to get a, uh, an, a high end NVIDIA card is just buy a pre built computer. Yes, I mean, my VR machine at home has a 3090 in it. Um, and I, you know, I, I got the whole machine for probably four grand or something like that. And it's a high end everything else. So chances are I probably pay two grand for the GPU or something like that. So I kind of got a deal. <laughs> if you look at it from that perspective. All right. Well, anyways, Apple didn't have the same hiccup this time around with Rosetta. Um, and it seems to be pretty impressive, almost like it, it's almost the antithesis of the hiccup because it's been pretty impressive that you've, they've been able to not have that break in the road of having software stop working because all the software kept working, including, um, I'm not having to do it on here, but uh, when you're, if you I run a lot of virtual machines. That's why I have 64 gigs of RAM on my machine. Not that I need that, but I can run multiple offering systems at the same time on here. So that starts using up all those extra resources your machine has. Parallels is, um, there's two products uh, for Mac, uh, VMware Fusion and Parallels are your two, uh, VirtualBox works on the Mac as well, but it would be, that's your free product. It's not as polished, but it's fine. Uh, but the only one that supports M1, at least the last I checked, is Parallels. Uh, VMware Fusion does not support the M1 processor. So now I could virtualize I would actually have to virtualize Intel stuff on it. Um, but, you know, interesting, interesting type stuff, but it hasn't been a hindrance to productivity, uh, let's say. So good stuff. So this is the current state of Mac OS X, uh, OS's 
but our modern day OS is based on top of Unix, which Apple did not create. You know, it was OpenBSD Unix in the, uh, at the beginning. What Apple really brought to the table is a nice, fancy, graphically pleasing front end called Aqua. So originally their front end was called Aqua uh, that made, you know, what usually was the graphic user interface for Unix, which back then was pretty boring into this sexier looking uh, uh, thing that I mentioned last time isn't as user friendly as Windows would be with the start button. But, you know, whatever. So, uh, and one of the reasons I like using a Mac is I get a terminal because I grew up using Unix. Well, I grew up using DOS and stuff, but from a geeky kid perspective, I always was running Linux on a box and I had FreeBSD on another box. So I was, I got very accustomed to using command line things. And well, in the early days, DOS was only command line as well. So I'm pretty comfortable here at the command line where a lot of this hut and peck stuff with the mouse is less productive for me. Um, but now, uh, some of you maybe have played with it. Um, this Windows, has Windows 11 released yet? The Linux shell, Bash shell? Okay, so Windows now has a Bash shell as well. Because um, originally when 11 dropped, it was beta. You had to add it, right? But now it's part of the release? Yeah. Okay, I got you. It, it shipped with 11. Maybe it was beta at the end of 10. Yeah. Yeah, but effectively you get a bash shell. Bash is a born again shell, uh, which is the, the name of the uh, program that's running the Unix shell because the original uh, shell on Unix was just SH. I'm sure I have it on here. Can't imagine a Unix machine not having SH. There you go. You have the original SH shell. See, that's cheating. Yeah, see, that's not SH. See, SH doesn't, um, one of the downsides was that it wouldn't let you press up to cycle back through your previous commands you typed. Yeah, this, is, this is faking it. Um, Bash has always had that. Then you had the seashell. Uh, T. Yes. Um, but bottom line is you had, you know, a zillion different kind of almost like you have different user interfaces graphic, you had a bunch of different shells and each shell had its own scripting language. So these are interpreted languages built into it. So kind of a, uh, an, an interesting, uh, an interesting thing, I guess. All right, so that kind of brings us up to date with our modern operating systems. We can go down the line of Linux as well, but it's going to be Linux kernel, Linux kernel, Linux kernel, Linux kernel, with different distributions that some are made more for security. If you've had Dr. Wall's uh, um, security class, you probably use Kali Linux in there. Um, What's a K-A-L-I, Kali Linux. Um, why? Because that distribution comes with a whole bunch of white hat hacker tools cracking wi-fi passwords all that all that crap um it's not that it made that software it just has pre-downloaded that crap and installed it you can you want to run fedora linux or SUSE linux or any of the other ubuntu you could put the same software on there because they're all running on intel pro intel architecture on the linux kernel linux the kernel is the operating system make sense um okay So let's go. So let's go here. So any any questions about that uh, architecture versus operating system thing? I know we we've, we've talked about it a lot now, but that's effectively the core of the the foundation on which we build systems programming on. Okay, so we're good with that. And really, from our perspective as system programmers, we probably care less about the architecture. Because really what we're, I mean, effectively the architecture side of things has been taken care of for us. What we are actually looking at is what system calls does this operating system provide me? Because I'm going to play all my games in terms of those system calls and accomplish what I'm going to accomplish with those, uh, 
with those system calls with the understanding that, hey, if it supports the fork system call, um, then presumably it's already fixed the problem of making it work on Intel versus PowerPC versus yada, 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 32-bit processors to 64-bit processors. There was the world of that for a long time. AMD, when they almost failed as a CPU company, um, AMD actually had the first 64-bit uh, consumer processor. Oh, well, AMD 64, very interestingly named. Um, came out during the time when their flagship processor was the Athlon, Athlon processor. And, uh, um, and it was a great processor, but the only way you could take advantage of it really was if you were willing to compile your own Linux kernel. You know, none of the Windows applications, even the 64-bit version of Windows, which would install on it, none of the applications would run on it. So you had the early days of um, uh, Windows, I guess it would have been Windows Vista, I think was when the 64-bit version uh, came out. You can get Windows Vista 32-bit or Windows Vista 64-bit. And if you got 64-bit, it came with, um, uh, uh, you would have two different, uh, you'd have a sys32 and a, six, a sys64 folder for where your applications would install, depending on if it was a 32 or a 64-bit application. And it would have to run it in compatibility mode on your AMD. So they, they, or AMD 64 had a similar thing to like Rosetta, where it did the conversion for you, but you had problems back then. And it really ended up being a problem for AMD. They were ahead of their time. The consumers weren't ready for 64-bit stuff. It didn't benefit uh, the consumer enough. Um, where um, Intel at the time was working on a 64-bit processor, but kind of targeted at business called the Itanium, the Itanium processor, which I don't think ever really became a real thing uh, because it pretty quickly jumped back to, you know, they had the, the, that's when they jumped to kind of the Xeon processors, Xeon everything. What's the difference between a, a Xeon processor and a, a, a normal consumer uh, Intel processor besides price? Anybody know? What are you really getting in terms of the benefit? The cores are identical. It's uh, usually uh, cache, L1, L2, L3 cache. Um, L3 cache maybe being the most important these days because that's the on chip, on, on processor memory that allows direct communication between the CPU cores. So bigger the cache memory there, the, the more information can be shared at the same time between the CPU cores. And servers typically have multiple users using them at the same time. So there might be a lot more need for processes to talk to each other. And one of the things we're going to be solving in here is processes talking to each other. All right, so if we think about what services does an operating system provide, we already talked about, you know, what is the generic job of an operating system? It sits between the human being and the hardware to let us use our computer better, right? You go back to some of the older computers like Univac or Edvac, and, you know, you had to walk up to it and twist on uh, vacuum tubes. You've probably seen that. Maybe you looked at that in like the 175 class, Univac. Computer. Uh, I had switches. Let's look at Edback. I can't tell if those are vacuum tubes or not, but it looks complex enough. Okay where you were manually working with the hardware, okay? You wanted to load the number seven in there, you were setting the bits, <laughs> you, were, you were flipping the, the, the vacuum tubes, uh, things like that. So, you know, uh, before we had operating systems, that's what we were doing. Okay? Now with VLSI, very large scale integration, our, our hardware is, I mean, these, these were the things the size of like, you know, giant rooms and gymnasiums and yada, yada, yada. Now they got a, a lot smaller, right? This is a big cell phone, right? So now we got computers that, that live in our pocket. You know, we're certainly not going to get in there with little tiny electrodes and touch two wires together, especially not when the, you know, now with our VLSI technology, what are the, um, uh, what's the current uh, 
poster boy is five nanometers, I think. I mean, like super close. The, the, when you see like that measurement on the, the newest processor, you know, the, this is the five nanometer technology. What that's talking about is if you got in there at the microscopic level and they're, they're, these are printed uh, circuit boards, you know, they're laying down you know, copper wires. How close can they put a wire to the next wire without having interference? Five nanometers. I could beat Usain Bolt in that distance if I have a little bit of a lead, right? <laughs> I got that guy. <laughs> so <laughs> it would be a funny experiment. Like, how much of a lead do I need to have to? Just to beat him in like the hundred meter, huh? Like, well, I think I could do better than that. Eighty-five meters. It was close. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a it's a photo finish, <laughs> but that would sell major tickets at ESPN. Yeah, you, know, you get this fat guy gets Usain Bolt retired. <laughs> How much of a lead does he need? Well, we can only run the race maybe a maximum of two times because I'm not going to be able to survive more than that, probably. <laughs> All right, so operating system sitting between the human being and the hardware because we don't want to work directly with our, with our hardware. So when we think about what services does a operating system provide, we've already talked about some of these. So, you know, uh, input output. And we can really think about this in terms of interfacing with monitors, keyboards, mice. So kind of our default um, other, I'm gonna say default hardware. And the reason I'm gonna do that is I'm also gonna, our modern operating systems, and this wasn't something in the early operating systems, you know, but if you go out and you get um, some new piece of hardware that just came out, even if we think about graphics cards, you go out and get the latest, greatest NVIDIA graphics card and you plug it in your computer, um, uh, by default, what are you gonna get on the screen? Modern operating systems typically have uh, some of the stuff built in. So we almost have to roll back maybe to Windows XP. So if I put a, an NVIDIA 3080, uh into a windows xp machine i plug it in you know you just spent you know three grand on this graphics card you're going to get 640 by 480 resolution eight bit color maybe 16 bit color it's going to look very generic not three thousand dollars worth because it's going to be running that graphics or that graphics card is what's called vga compatible probably super vga compatible svga all right so it's going to be running that graphic card in the most generic um, way possible that is built into the operating system. It's going to say, oh, okay, I know how to talk to a graphics card. Not, I know how to talk to the Ferrari of graphics cards. I know how to talk to a generic graphics card. So then what do you have to do to get your graphics card to start looking impressive? What do you have to install on your computer? Go ahead. Driver. So driver support. So special software that tells the OS how to use the special features of third party hardware. Those are drivers, right? So now our operating systems come with the ability for you to install drivers. In the early days, if your operating system didn't ship with the ability to talk to a piece of hardware, you weren't using that new piece of hardware or you weren't using any of its special abilities. So you didn't have this idea of, you know, latest, greatest graphics card or latest, greatest, pick your favorite hardware thing coming out, uh, which, you know, now provides this, that, or the next feature, because if it wasn't built into the OS, it doesn't matter how great the hardware is, the OS isn't gonna talk to it on those channels. So drivers now allow two things to happen independently. You have the operating system, which supports drivers, then you have the hardware builders who can come up with whatever they want. And as long as they can write a, whatever the operating system is, compatible driver to teach that OS how to use its system calls, its IO uh, system to talk to the various capabilities of that hardware, 
the hardware will work as long as you install the driver. You know, if you have um, uh, Windows 10, Windows 11, and you had a, a, a 3080 that you uh, dropped in, it would probably detect it as a 3080 um, using Windows default uh, 3080 drivers, which would look fine, but probably the first thing you do is go and download the NVIDIA experience and dri drivers to get whatever extra bells and whistles, or at least make sure it always stays up to date, yada, 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 um, that kind of stuff. But you know, still a, a, a thing. Sure. What else does uh, OS provide? It provides process management. It provides processor, so it's a CPU management. It provides a file system. And it provides something called IPC. This is probably something that would fall underneath process management, inter process communication. So making two processes talk to each other while they're running. And then we have an additional caveat of what if, because uh, our modern day operating systems have a lot of security stuff built into it. So what if you have one process that's owned by the administrator it's running in uh, admin space, root space. And then you have another process that was written by the, just a normal user. It's running in user space. Well, what if the two of those need to talk to each other? Okay, You have to go through Fort Knox to get to, get to those guys. So we have to have something built in the offering system that enables that communication if the right things are, are uh, involved. Make some sense? All right, so we're going to start looking at some of the system calls involving uh, these things uh, next time, and uh, probably we'll start writing a little something uh, code wise uh, next class. Questions, comments, concerns, bribes. Okay, I will see everybody on what day is today? So, see you on Tuesday, right? Yeah.